I have greatly anticipated this series of meetings, being able to draw our attention to things that are coming up. It's very important to know what's up ahead. And seeing that we live in such a time, it's such an evil time, where the truth is rarely sought after or spoken about. It's especially needful. We know what is up ahead. And I think that makes it obvious that seeing that these are the circumstances we live in, we're going to experience a lot of adversity and a lot of affliction. But for sure, the Lord does minister peace and comfort in times of trial. Another way we make it through the world's calamity is by focusing on what's coming up for us who are fighting the good fight of faith. Just by means of some examples, there are certain things that are done even in the world with the outcome in mind. That's like whatever results from what you're doing, that's what motivates people to keep doing it. Suppose an army goes to battle with invaders coming to sack the city or raid it. Each soldier will go into battle with the thought that if he defeats this enemy, then his family and his countrymen are safe from harm. When running a race, it is the prize that motivates each runner to run faster, even when it's painful to do so. When men work long, exhausting jobs, sometimes dangerous ones, it is the pay they receive that motivates them not to quit or slack in what they do, but rather do it with the best efforts that they have. Because the better you do in a job, the more you receive. Likewise, as believers, we have our minds and affections set on things to come so that we might endure the present. As we go through these various things that are to come, we realize that these things are not just mentioned for nothing. Rather, they are mentioned so that we might dwell on them continually. See, when we go over things like a triumphant entrance and no more tears, God wants you to think about this. He wants this to be in your mind continually. Because as we, why we ponder on these things, it affects the way we live and the way that we think. Now getting into this passage here, it starts off by saying, I will make him a pillar, him who overcomes. A pillar he will be. And that's actually a very interesting thing to consider. Let me share with you just some other things that come to mind, like when you consider a pillar. What's something like you could say that's unique about a pillar? Well, first, a pillar is strong. And it has the ability to endure long periods of time. The strength of a pillar can hold large amounts of weight on top of it without crumbling. They are also very thick and very difficult to destroy. They actually are made for supporting large structures and sustaining them, even during times when things might normally fall apart. Second, pillars are made to stay in a certain spot. They're not the kind of things you can just transport. Well, let's try to take that and let's just move it over here. You move, you take something, you move a pillar or whatever's on top of it, it's going to crumble. That's not the way it works with a pillar. So wherever they're put, they are made to stay there. Permanently. Third, a pillar, if you look at one, it's always standing up, never leaning or on its side. And even the large size of one makes it difficult to knock it over or push it aside. Another thing come to mind, when you see a pillar, you usually see them in groups, whether it be several or many, that they all have the same purpose, holding something up. So when considering all of this, the saints are made pillars we see that Christ makes us strong, he causes us to stand up, never fall, be united, working together, consistent, and he makes us fit for the environment that we will be in. Right now, Christ is working us, he's cultivating us, like a f- farmer cultivates a field, so that we might be ready to stay with him for all eternity. So when we look at this passage, we're looking at a pillar as a completed work. And even the church today, it's called the pillar and ground of the truth. That's in 1 Timothy 3.15. That is, that it holds the truth up and it supports it. That's what it means. It sustains it when under attack. Men come against the truth. Well, the, the church keeps holding it up. And it preserves it when, other, when it would otherwise fall apart. So the, the pillar, it's like a picture of strength, durability, consistency, standing up, being grounded and settled in a place, not being moved. That's what you get from a pillar. And then next says, well, he'll, he will go no more out. That's the next thing. But what exactly does that mean? He shall go no more out. In what sense do we go out? The passage gives the idea of no more departure, no more decline. In this world, we experience things like weakness, discouragement, and danger. And we're constantly in need of help due to the draining things of this world. And we need strength and restoration from the Lord, which, praise the Lord, he does provide for us. The passage reminds us of the end of these things. No more times of weakness, 
No more need to be restored due to being drained or wearied, and no more having to go out in harsh and dangerous environments. First of all, look at this passage from the aspect of going into like a dangerous realm like the world, because it says go out. Well, you've got to think about like Go out where? What's that talking about? Well, we do have fellowship with the Lord, and he's, he is here to help us when we call on him. We do have to live in the world that is hostile toward our God. Allow me to speak some with, about the world that we live in, like how it's described, like where we live right now. While we are chosen of God and destined for heaven, we're not yet in glory. And while we wait for the Lord to return, we must remain in this evil and sinful world and put up with its defiling influences and distractions. Jesus said, this is what he said in John 7, so he says, the world hates him. That's his description of the world. It hates me. And he also said that we would have tribulation while in the world. That's John 16, 33. So indeed, the world's not our home. That's why you're called a stranger and a pilgrim. In today's world, they've called that like outcast. They don't consider you their own. Because Jesus has saved us, the world no longer recognizes us as its own. With that being the case, it shouldn't be a surprise that we encounter an abundance of hostility while in the world. Paul described the world as this present evil world. Peter says that we have escaped the corruption that is in the world. Corrupt, that's his description. The fact that we're in a dangerous realm shows that there are risks and hazards all around us. That being the case, we are admonished to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Seeing that we are in such a realm, we need protection and deliverance on a continual basis. Jesus told us to pray that God would not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I don't take that as a one-time thing, that we pray that. I cannot see such a prayer if necessary, if believers are not in any danger. God certainly, you know, he hasn't left us defenseless. He's given us his holy armor. It's in Ephesians 6 there given us his armor so that we might stand against the wiles of the devil, stand in the evil day. So the provisions have been made for you to persevere through this. Amen. And with that armor, you can resist and fight as you progress through the world. David himself was even aware of trouble. He wrote this, he said, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there's none to help. Either it's God helps me or I don't make it. And he even described God as our help and shield. That's two things that are attributed to God. The fact that we need help and protection shows the world's in fact dangerous. And we do give thanks for environments of peace and renewal and fellowship. Well, in the world, we are provided places where we can regain our strength. Like even right now, right? We're here, we're here meeting together. This is like a safe haven right here. A shelter from the storm where we can regain our strength and grow in our spiritual abilities. And David writes of these kind of environments, too. He writes that the Lord, he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. That's like, an, that's like a peaceful environment. Mm -hmm. and he says later in that same verse, he says, he restores my soul. Amen. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Like restore, bring you back up, get you strong again so you can keep going. Amen. And David was also aware of unholy environments as well. He knew about there are some places that were going to take away from you if you're there. Yeah. Hence, he writes this. He says, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. So he was aware. House of God, that's a place I want to stay. Tents of wickedness, that's a place I want to avoid. John, the apostle John writes of two different environments. Right? He, what he speaks about is light and darkness. That's the two environments he speaks of. And there is such a thing as walking in the light. First John 1 7. There's also such a thing as walking in darkness. It's in First John chapter 2. What I want to get across to you is, is go out gives the idea of having to go between safe and unsafe environments frequently. It's like being in a desert and then finding an oasis. You know, like to meet your destination, you have to go through this place where there's not a lot of food, there's not a lot of water, there's not a lot of provision there, but you come across this oasis. You can, you can regain your strength, and then after that, you have to progress to the desert again. Thank God we have these places where we can gain our strength so we won't perish, but this is very well like David said. I'm in a dry and thirsty land where there no water is. That's how, he, that's how he described the world. Hence, he was calling for God to help him, give him provisions. So this is, why we, this is what we're having to do. We, even after this means over, we're going to have to go back out and meet to our needs and everything. And I give thanks we're not going to have to do this permanently. Eventually, we'll all be together and we won't have to meet temporarily on a rare basis. This also brings to mind the weakness and decline we experience while we're in the world. 
David wrote of experiences like this. He said, my heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it also is far from me. That's a moment of weakness there. And he also writes, my soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. That, see, that gives you the idea of absence. Like, he's not, I want him to come to me and restore me. While the Lord is with us as we meet together and he's there to strengthen us along the way, there is a sense where we are apart from him temporarily. Hence, Paul writes that we're willing to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. I mean, he may help us, he may provide for us, but we're not with him in the sense that we want to be. We're not joined to him like in the final sense. So in that sense, you're out. Jesus, and also on the subject of weakness, Jesus admonishes us to pray that we don't fall in temptation, making known that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's going to hinder you. It's going to make it difficult for you to do what is right. And Paul said there's another law in his members, warring against the law of his mind. So you have something in you, fighting against the good that you have in you, trying to get you to do something completely opposite, something you don't even want to do. That's something you have to like endure while in the world while you're out. Now Jesus, in a, just in a sense, experienced this when he was in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. It says that after the time of temptation, that when he was weird, the angels came and they ministered to him. So, I mean, that shows it was hard for him, that temptation. It was. He had to be, he had to be ministered to. He had to, be, he had to be strengthened after that. But Jesus isn't in the wilderness anymore. He's not. He is, he's destroyed the works of the devil, and he's sitting at the right hand of God with death not having any dominion over him. And Jesus will never again experience weakness or weariness now that he's highly exalted. And such a, a time such as this is coming for you as well, brother, just like it has for him. Soon all your longing and your struggles will come to an end. Even though we struggle when in times of decline, Jesus ministers to us by telling us to be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. Now at this point, I'm going to show go more into like why, why we'll no longer go out when in heaven. This is the part that's up ahead right here. What I just went over, that's what we're currently going through. What about what's up ahead? When we read, we, why we'll go no more out, don't think like being chained up in a corner, be, not being permitted to leave. Like a little stubborn child be sitting in a chair. You can't get up for five This is not what he's talking about at all. Rather, think of it being a place that you've longed to be in your whole life. Nothing threatening your peace and your happiness there. That's something you want to think about. Think about no enemy being able to steal what you have from you or drag you out. Think of there no possibility for backsliding or falling away or being cast out. Think about what you have in heaven never growing old and never having to be given up. Think about being with your Savior and nothing standing between you and him when together. That's what's involved in not going out anymore. But why is this so? Well, first, there's several reasons why we're not going to go out anymore when in heaven. The first thing here is your adversary, the devil, is going to be destroyed along with all his angels. The scriptures say this in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, saying he's going to be cast in the lake of fire. He's going to be tormented there forever. Yes. Forever. Now, right now, the devil lurks around as a lion seeking whom he may devour. Devour, kill him, eat him up. But in heaven, brethren, there will be no Roman lion seeking to devour you. He will not be even in the same place as you are. He'll be cast out. Forever, Him and all his hosts will be shut out of, of heaven with no possibility of ever coming back to fight you. When Jesus comes, the devil's work stops. Amen. And that's not going to be a very difficult thing for Jesus to do to stop the devil. I know some people kind of give the idea there's going to be like a big war or something like that between God and Jesus. But that's between the devil and Jesus. But I don't see how this could possibly be so. The king of glory is going to have trouble with his foe that is limited in power and can't even do anything without the Lord's permission. Jesus is going to have trouble with us? Is Jesus, the highly exalted one, going to have to work to overthrow the dragon that Michael the archangel defeated in heaven? Trust me, brethren, your victory is secure in Christ Jesus. It's just as sure now as it will be on the day, of, the day that Jesus returns. So there's no need to fear about the devil somehow overriding this thing that's been written about you or causing it not to come to pass. Your foe will be cast out, and you will never have to quench his fiery arrows ever again. Another reason why we will not go out is because there will not be a dangerous or faithless realm to go out to when we reach the end. 
all sinful and vile realms that we had to guard ourselves in in this life won't exist. 2 Peter 3.10 states the world will be burned up, meaning the world will no longer be a place to commit iniquity. It will be a purged from all filth permanently. And also in the coming place of our abode, it said, in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Revelation 21.27 In this world, we have to be cautious because certain things can come in, creep in, and defile what you have. So you have to be on your guard, even when places of safety, something could sneak in if you're not careful. Something good can be corrupted. However, in the world to come, nothing defiling enters in. Nothing becomes infected. Nothing becomes corrupted. There's no possibility of something profane and vile like creeping in and, or any sin breaking out in your mists. Hence, there's no place we can technically like go out to. So there's no need for things such as armor in the world to come. War will have ended at that point. All the struggling ends. So you will be at peace forever. Another reason that we will not go out anymore is because we will have no desire to leave the place that we are in. At the time that Jesus comes, it said we shall be like him. 1 John 3 verse 2. Before we shall see him as he is. Not that we'll just like look like him, but we'll be like him in nature as well. At that time, we will be a completed work. Everything that it was in us that was defiled or sinful will be gone for good. There will be no old man or sinful passions to deal with in heaven. No more Romans 7 struggles. You can say it that way. Well, I long for that. We will be righteous and pure in the most absolute sense. And we'll have everything we hope for right there in heaven. So there will be no desire to leave because we will be perfect and only desirous of righteous things which are only found with God. Also remember that Jesus did pray that we would be one, as he and the Father are one, and that we would be one in them. I cannot see us being one in Christ and being anything short of complete, perfect, and incapable of corruption. I also made this point earlier, but I'll gladly make it again. We will be made pillars, meaning that we will be fitted for the heavens specifically. There will be no other place for us to be placed. Right now we are being cultivated, prepared, readied, and molded for the kingdom of God. Eventually, we will be fit for that environment, and that environment alone. And I greatly anticipate the time when that work is completed. Now, on a last note here, it's important to note that this word only applies to those who overcome. That's the very first thing it says in the passage. To him who overcomes, will I make a pillar. That is, those who make it to the end and don't fall midway or give up. Those people. Now, brethren, so many people think they can be lazy and still get that prize. Well, this isn't so. I know there's a lot of teachings that kind of produces these kind of results. Do nothing, and then you'll get the prize. No, this is not so. Paul says, run that you might obtain. That's what he said. Run. Sometimes I think professing believers, they treat the race like a morning jog. I mean, just trot around the block a few times. I got my exercise for the day. I can just do what I want the rest of the day, and then, you know, nothing comes from that. Paul makes the point that every runner in the race has his mind set on the prize and only one of them will get it. So with that being the case, every single runner in that race is going to run as fast as he can and not quit for anything because they all want the same thing. Likewise, we run with that same kind of determination in the race that we are in. It is only if we run to the